This is an ABC podcast. All right, this is going to be good, isn't it? And I suddenly realised that what writing is about is not plot, it's not characterisation, it's not any of that. It's about conviction of tone. Uh, But I read that at least once a year. The most beautiful pages that I've ever read. I just had to go back over and over to suck the marrow out of these stories. And I think she is the most extraordinary writer. And I love her books. I think they're brilliant. The descriptions are sublime. If you get the tone right, the reader will go with you. They'll follow you wherever you want to take them. Hi, welcome to Radio National's monthly on-air and podcast book club. I'm Kate Evans. And I'm Cassie McCullough. And today it's all about the Miles Franklin Literary Award, Australia's most prestigious books prize, first awarded in 1957 and established by a bequest from the novelist Stella Miles Franklin. And this year and last year, Cassie, you hosted those awards. And today we're going to talk about the winner, Amanda Laurie, for her novel, The Labyrinth, as well as talking about the other five books on the shortlist. Yes, in the second half of today's discussion, we'll be talking books by Aravind Adiga, Robbie Arnott, Andrew Pippos, Madeline Watts and Daniel Davis Wood. And as always, we're including your comments from the ABC Book Club Facebook group, 46,000 strong and full of book recommendations, reviews, queries and opinions. And there are hundreds of comments on it about this year's winning novel, The Labyrinth. Gillian Jordan called it a gently unfolding story that went deep into the heart of grief, resilience and overcoming. And she added, it is a book I will return to. While Cheryl Moncur said, loved it. Grief, loss, hope, redemption, beautifully written. Gail Hennessy also is ready to reread it. She says, I know the story, but this time I will savour the meditative style and enjoy the way she brings to life the characters in an Australian landscape. And Graham Anderson said, after reading most of the long list and all of the shortlisted books, good on you, Graham, it's clear that Laurie's precise tone elevates it above the others. A beautiful and inspiring read. Congratulations, Amanda. And with those comments in mind, let's welcome today's book club guests. Tom Wright is with us. He's a dramaturg and writer and Associate Artistic Director at Sydney's Belvoir. Hi, Tom. Greetings. Lovely to be here again. (laughs) Lovely to have you back, Tom. Now, last time we spoke with you, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, I think, and you were pointing out the importance of reading the local, and that's really stayed with me, that thought about walking our own streets and reading about our own environment. Is that how you're still reading down the track? I'm still reading that way, and it's interesting you bring that up, Cassie, in the light of the shortlist for the Miles Franklin this year. Mm. There is a strong sense of our streets and our neighbourhoods and our environment being what's experienced and almost the limits of our experience at the moment. We do seem to be entering a very navel-gazing time, both for good and for bad. Indeed. And also with us is reviewer Nicole Abadie, who also hosts the podcast Books, Books, Books. Nicole, welcome. Thank you very much, Kate and Cassie. It's great to be here again. How would you describe your COVID reading habits, Nicole? Gosh, Kate, a bit of both. So I'm trying to read Australian novels as much as I can, but I've also got some really excellent international ones that I'm looking at at the moment. A couple that I've been reading recently that I've really loved, one is Secrets of Happiness by Joan Silber, and another one that's actually being launched today on the day that we record is one that I've really loved called When Things Are Alive, They Hum by a debut author called Hannah Bent. And that's been one of the favourite books that I've read this year. So for me, a mix of the international and Australian, mainly fiction. Well, let's talk about the winner of this year's Miles Franklin Literary Award, Amanda Laurie. Her books include The Morality of Gentlemen and Camille's Bread, which was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin in 1996. She's been an academic as well as a writer. The Labyrinth is her eighth novel. And The Labyrinth is Erica Marsden's story, and Laurie has labelled it a pastoral. That is a story in which a character moves away from the city to find meaning or redemption in a rural or regional life. Nicole Abadie, can you set up the story for us? What do we need to know? Look, it's about a woman called Erica, as you say, whose adult son has been convicted of a terrible crime and he's been given a life sentence. She decides to move from Sydney to the south coast where the prison is and she buys a run-down shack. 
in a small fictional town called Garanella. Erica is very alone. Both of her parents are dead. She's estranged from her brother Axel. She doesn't have a partner. And she's in what she describes as a fugue state. She and her brother Axel had a very unusual background. Their mother abandoned the family when the kids were young and they were raised largely by their father, Ken, who was a psychiatrist. And they grew up on the grounds of a mental asylum. And very significantly, it had a labyrinth where Erica and Axel used to play when they were little. When Erica buys this shack in Garanella, she suddenly has a dream about creating a labyrinth. From there, we watch her endeavours to make that dream become a reality. And we also see Erica's journey, I think, from being very alone to starting to connect with people in this small South Coast community, neighbours, and in particular, a young stonemason called Jerko, who is going to work with her on actually building the labyrinth. Tom, the book starts with that family background of growing up in an asylum. How important was that for establishing the novel, do you think? It sets, it sets it up beautifully because it sort of, you feel like you're in a family story almost from the word go, but the family is contextualised as being both sort of metaphorically and literally a little bit insane. The idea that actually there's a, a lack of mental precision at work, even in the narrative voice, let alone in the various characters, is set up very gently in a very sophisticated, writerly way. We're sort of being invited as readers almost from the word go to say, look, this whole thing takes place in a labyrinth or a constructed set of sort of intertwining chambers and that is also contextualized within the grounds of something that was once an asylum it's not when the um, when erica goes back to the asylum it's now a sort of a place for bourgeois divertissement it's a cafe it's a museum it's an art center it's become this sort of genteel place but when she was growing up there it was full of people under periods of great distress and so one of the big and most fascinating themes about the whole thing this liminal space this space between living and dying, between youth and old age, between madness and sanity, whatever they are that Erica sort of has to inhabit. It's all set up in the very early chapters of this sort of quite beautifully evoked idea of what it is to grow up surrounded by people whom society is determined to be mad. And that pastoral aspect of it is further reinforced by when she goes back in search of this labyrinth from her, that she remembers from her childhood, it's disappeared under the grass and someone souvenired the convict made bricks and they've long since been stacked up and put away. The labyrinth no longer exists. It's become a labyrinth of the mind and it's one that she's going to have to find a way to either wander through or possibly dissolve. So yes, the, the idea of life or Australia as an asylum is set up very strongly from the word go. Yes, and The Labyrinth, obviously, it's the title of the book, so it becomes a key meditation itself. And there's this nice distinction that she makes about a labyrinth not being a maze. A maze is designed to trick and frustrate, where a labyrinth is designed to free your mind. But I think also it's an asylum. The family is deeply steeped in psychiatry and self-analysis and the big archetypes of human nature. And so we're allowed to immediately understand that's where we're going. In essence, the novel is a woman coming to terms with not only what's happened to her son, but her entire life. So we learn all about Erica Marsden and what's happened. And as you've already pointed out, Nicole, her mother left. The father actually was murdered in the asylum by one of the inmates. We also were going back through Erica's childhood, and then through the childhood of Daniel, her son. And we learn more about Erica being this inner city kind of lefty woman and living a precarious lifestyle with lots of adventures and men until Daniel comes along. And we learn his childhood's been very precarious. And so we're invited to trace back, why is this? Why is she living a life like this? And so it's, it's an insecure family structure underneath what seems to be a very strong woman. Nicole, one of the things about examining the family structures that kept coming up in the Facebook group was people reflecting on what they called the maternal torment of this woman whose, you know, life has been changed by her son's imprisonment. Um, and so a woman called Helen Neal talks about the dehumanising, heartbreaking visits she makes to the prison. What do you make of the way that the parent and child relationship figures 
It's a very difficult relationship between Erica and her son, Daniel. We learn that Daniel's father fled, abandoned the two of them when Daniel was only a baby, which seems to be a parallel to uh, Erica's own mother leaving her children when, when they were young. So she's raised him as a single mother. We learn that she's had some abusive relationships. So since Gabriel, who she had Daniel with, she's had some abusive relationships and she actually describes quite serious injuries. We don't hear all that much about what went on between her and Daniel as a child, but the most reflection that we get on their relationship is in these visits to the prison. And I must say, I found those almost excruciating. She has to see him on his own, not with any other parents and prisoners because he is so violent. He's he's known as volatile. And he seems, he really seems to hate her, I think. To me, it wasn't absolutely clear why he felt that anger towards her, whether it was just a reflection of general misogyny, which is another theme that runs very strongly through the book, whether it was just that he hadn't been brought up with a father. But I found it a little difficult to understand why he behaved in such a venomous way towards Erica. Yeah, there is some suggestion that he has a um, barely diagnosed psychiatric condition himself, although we don't really see too far into that. But what about the other part of Erica's life? Besides these you know, harrowing visits to the prison, she also begins to encounter the locals in Garanulla. <laughs> Tom, what did you make of the cast of the you know, the kooky Australian <laughs> seaside town? Yeah, this is the one where it teeters but never luckily falls into the harbour, so to speak, of becoming sea change. This idea of sort of uh, a woman at a stage in her life where she needs to leave the city behind and leave behind some of the un sort of reconciled parts of her life only to discover potentially love, potentially redemption, potentially spiritual, rhapsody, whatever, in a seaside town. You almost feel familiar with that, but Amanda's far too clever an author to allow that to ever feel like the cliche it could so easily become. There's this cast of uh, locals, um, genial, middle-aged women like herself, and then there's the usual panoply of men that we, we become used to in sort of contemporary Australian fiction. There's the Towers of Pomposity who won't listen to her. And then there's sort of um, tight <laughs> lip sociopaths. Eames. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, Lewis exactly. Eames, the retired sort of, archetype. Archety. Yes, and who sort of, who she sort of initially says, can you help me with the labyrinth? But, you know, asking one of these kind of self-absorbed men so certain in their knowledge that they understand the world better than everyone else, they're the last people you'd get to help you build a labyrinth because this is both a literal <laughs> labyrinth, as I say, but it's also a metaphorical one. And that's the kind of purpose, I suppose, of this bucolic cast or the, it's not done in a condescending way. So even using that adjective makes it sound mm. a little bit dismissive. This is actually meant to be a panoply of human beings who can be her spirit guides and can help her. But there's this beautiful characterization of, and Jokha's he, he, always sort of kept a little bit mysterious, never quite believe his story, this itinerant illegal migrant who is dismissive and he's kind of uh, evasive. And at one point, one of her neighbours accuses Erica of being in love with him. The whole thing is beautifully complicated, but he's almost perfectly monstrous so that there can be no frisson. He has to actually put it through the test so that she can get through her labyrinth and he's in some ways this an antithesis to her Daniel so she's got this mm. son this Daniel in the lion's den in his own labyrinth in his own prison trapped in his own mind or his you know absence of mind and then yeah, there's his this own free spirit this illegal migrant who sort of wanders into her life literally out of the Royal National Park who's free in every way that Daniel isn't but is likewise a sort of son figure a son that she didn't have and at that point the book becomes nice and complicated and rich and that coastal town moves out of the realm of something familiar. And Tom, you mentioned the neighbour who um, suggested that she might have had some sort of frisson with Jerko. Yeah. And I love the way she responded to that because she thinks, what would you know about the appetites yeah. of a woman like me? And in my own notes, I'd forgotten to write down his name. I just called him the grumpy sod next door. Right. Um, right. Yeah, right. Right. But what he says is, Jerko, he's got a filthy beard. Like, no way. <laughs> I like that. He's caught in his own labyrinth. He's, he's a, a minor figure who's caught in a labyrinth of his own silence and resentment about big things, big socioeconomic structures, big ways in which his life has changed. He's trapped in so many ways. And by the end of the book, he's sort of wandering around in the grass on the dunes helping out. There's a number of ways in which people find their ways out of the labyrinths in this book. 
And it strikes me that there's this beautiful, um, which every every reader, and I'm sure on the Facebook group, everyone's commenting on it as well when you go through the comments, is that there's a big difference between a labyrinth and a maze. You know, as Cassie said, a maze is designed to entrap you, but a labyrinth is a test of the heart. And it's not just Erica. Almost everyone's heart is tested in Amanda's book. Sometimes it's a tool of the heart, not necessarily of the brain. You can just stand still and let the thing dissolve around you. And that happens for so many of the characters is that if they have time and space, you can st stand still and let the labyrinth dissolve or fold back into the landscape rather than trying to endlessly bash your way through it. There's a deep sort of um, very Australian spirituality to the book, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it has such strong appeal. The other thing about the labyrinth is it's not just about the final labyrinth, it's about the construction of it. And that is something that is in the book from the very first chapter. And that's the importance of making something. And her father and indeed she, I think, and, and the writer are really interested in the work of Jung. And there's a quote from her father where he says to her, when you make something, you become a rivet in the fabric of the real. So the process of making is what's important and what shapes the whole book. Here's what Amanda Laurie herself said about the project of making things. And in a way, one of the sort of subterranean themes of the book is the redemptive power of art. And by art, I don't mean necessarily painting or, or sculpture. It can be gardening, it can be sewing, it can be cooking, it can be whatever you do that's creative. That was Amanda Laurie speaking to Claire Nichols on the book show. But Nicole Abadie, that process of making and creativity, what does it do, not just to Erica, but to the other characters in this book? I really love that aspect of it, Kate. I have to say, as someone who knits and cooks, the idea of making something, being curative, being redemptive, really appealed to me. And there's talk about when the father, Ken, set up a, a workshop at the asylum and he said, a man who doesn't use his hand is a mind untethered. And we think we see various characters. There's another character, a friend of her nephew's who crochets and they come and visit Erica and she really latches onto that, the idea of him crocheting and making something. And that is clearly a very strong theme for the book. And I think, as Tom said, we look at, at Ray, who starts off being this, you know, real old curmudgeon and a very uh, sexist one as well, I might say. And eventually he comes to the party and he wants to be part of making the labyrinth himself. That's his own sort of personal odyssey, his own personal journey. So I think this idea of making something is a very strong sort of connecting theme for the book. And it starts with the epigraph saying, the cure for many ills, noted Jung, is to build something. And for a book that could be understood as a book about grief and pain, that creative side of it, to me, made it a book about joy and creativity, particularly by the time we got to the end. But I wonder if we could talk a bit more about the writing and what she's done with this book. Let's hear Amanda Laurie again describing the structure. My aim was to write a narrative that felt like a meditative walk into and out of a labyrinth. And so to get technical about it, it takes a lot of very careful control to do that. Um, you really cannot afford uh, a loose word or a spare word. It's got the prose has to be very tight and you have to kind of meet your mark. You know, actors, when they're acting in front of a camera, have to, to hit their mark every time. Well, in this kind of story, you've got to hit the mark every time or you break the spell. So needless to say, it took many drafts. Yes, it's interesting to hear that. The structure is one thing. The style of writing is also quite distinctive. I found it brittle. There was a sort of slightly depressive quality about it. And I don't mean that as a negative criticism. We were inside the mind of a woman in her older years looking back with some bitterness perhaps or some distillation of wisdom about what's happened and that meant very short sentences at times, very little punctuation. You had to often sort of structure or, or piece together exactly what was being pointed at. Very rich I think in observation but sparing on the page. 
Yeah, it's um, it's clear that you're in when you read this book, you're in the hands of someone who knows how to write. And, and Amanda's um, quote that we just played is very pertinent here. She's thought about it very carefully. And when she talks about hitting her marks, she brings up things rhythmically. When Erica dreams, it, she dreams re at regular points. And each one of those dreams is like a portal into another level. She uses dialogue sparingly, but when she uses it, it rhythmically um, suits all of her purposes. Words in the novel clang like bells and hang over the thing as they sort of resonate through pages, and that means that she's probably hit her mark. So that sense of moving in and out of a labyrinth is very carefully <laughs> evoked. Nicole, the writing? I, I agree with all of those things that Tom has just said, and in addition, I think the actual structure of the book. When Amanda talks about the labyrinth and how it works, she talks quite a lot about the looping backwards and forwards as you make your way to the centre, and that's structurally what this does. It moves backwards and forwards between the past and the present. So we're in the, the present with her in this small country town wanting to build the a labyrinth and then we loop back and we find out something about her past. There's a real rhythm to the way she does that as well, I think. So I, I think that must be part of what she means as well when she talks about the structure of the book being like a labyrinth. It's very clever. And Nandini Bose, one of the members of the Facebook group, found it a quiet triumph, beautifully mm. written. And there's something to be said for that idea of quietness and meditation, which I guess goes back to the whole thematic issues in the book. Um, I'm just reading some of the, the comments here. One from Helen Neal's really interesting. She says, I read The Labyrinth initially because of my interest in labyrinths and was absorbed by Amanda Laurie's account of the maternal torment of a woman whose life is ruled by her need to stay near her imprisoned and dreadfully disturbed son. The author's description of the dehumanising, heartbreaking visits to the prison are heart-wrenching glimpses into parental hell. Her desire to create her own labyrinth seems to be her life's distraction from that hell and it leads to some unusual relationships with the local residents. And yeah, there's that balance again of the, you know, desperation of the relationship with Daniel but also the levity of some of the description of these inhabitants of Garanella. Well, I think this is a worthy recipient of this year's Miles Franklin Literary Award, Amanda Laurie's The Labyrinth. And it's published by text. And by the way, just on the, the actual book itself, I loved the typesetting in this and also the page design, so thanks for that text. Come look down, baby, we can't look down. Turning like an octagon Turning cools around the oxygen If there's a reason why There's no reason why We won't know it from a hologram That could show up at the close of hands Just like that we're happy again Nothing else has changed this is Radio National's on-air and podcast monthly book club with me, Kate Evans, and with Cassie McCullough, as always, and guests this week, books writer Nicole Abadie and theatre writer Tom Wright. And we're now going to move through the remaining five books in the Miles Franklin shortlist in alphabetical order, and we're each going to take it in turns leading the charge on the discussion. So Cassie McCullough, Aravind Adiga's Amnesty, take it away. Mm, well, A is for Aravind Adiga. He's an Indian writer and journalist who currently lives in Australia. He spent a lot of time here. He went to James Roos High. Uh, his debut novel, The White Tiger, won the 2008 Booker Prize, but this is his fifth amnesty that we're talking about here. I've got to say, I'm extremely fond of this book. It's around a young man whose name is Danny, or that's a transliteration from the Sri Lankan. He's in Australia having outstayed his student visa and he's living illegally and working as a cleaner. And the entire novel is set across 24 hours, just one day in Sydney. And it's a a really stinging portrait of both a city 
and a mindset of a country which chooses not to see some of the most underpaid, underprivileged, underclass that's right in front of us. So he, to get by, is living basically in the storeroom of an old convenience store, rundown convenience store in Glebe with an awful man running it. And by day he goes about cleaning houses. To do this and get as much income as he can, he's bought himself a portable vacuum Vacuum cleaner, a turbo Model E super suction acquired from Kmart and it's strapped to him. We're told he resembles an astronaut with a jet booster, a silver canister with a rubber, a blue rubber nozzle peeping out. And uh, he's heading around town. He's got a plastic bag which has his lunch in it, a packet of black and gold, $2.25 for 10 cheese slices, along with a 60 cent wholemeal bun. So, you know, he's really literally on the breadline here. You know, he's poor as anything. And his descriptions or the narrator's descriptions of what he sees of Australia is brutal. <laughs> I really love this book. I really liked it too, Cassie. And one of the things that I like is the way that it remaps the city and remaps your way of imagining city in, in this case that I know that I live in. And does it partly in terms of the visibility and invisibility of the brown body? Because one of the things that he does is he talks about what it means to notice another um, Indian man in particular on the street and the way that they both recognise each other or sometimes there's a whole sort of hierarchy of somebody who looks, as he put it, very legal and somebody who's more on the margins. And he's making, the character's making these assessments all the time. Who are you and how do you relate to this place? There's a central moral dilemma in this novel too, isn't there, Tom? It is. It's, um, it's on one level, it's this book about visibility and invisibility in a portrait of contemporary Australia. But the actual structural device is a, it's a thriller in a way. It's like, will he or won't he? Will Danny talk about what he's seen about this vital information that he holds and, and give away his own right to freedom? You know, if doing the moral thing in this case will imperil him in so many ways. And as a reader, you're sort of sitting there waiting for, is it inevitable or is he going to resist? Is he going to try to stay that invisible ghost-like character trapped in time, trapped in space? Or is he actually going to um, make himself real again, but in so doing end his time in Australia. So the whole thing feels like it could so easily dissolve in a moment. Because um, what you're talking about is he realises that one of his clients, one of the people whose homes he cleans, has been murdered. And so if he comes forward to the police and gives the information that he knows may reveal this and also lead to who's killed her, he could also then suffer consequences of being deported because he's an illegal immigrant. So he wrestles with this throughout the 24 hours and you learn more and more about what he's seen and what's going on, but also about what it would mean for him to do the right thing. And when I spoke to Aravind Adiga, we had really interesting conversations about ambiguity and where it sits. But um, I also asked him about where this story came from. And let's hear what he said. I, I have met people like this in Australia who are cleaning houses, who are working at sort of uh, beauty salons, um, who are cleaning tables, who have overstayed the visa or are here illegally. And um, this kind of person who is here under the law uh, faces every single day tremendous moral choices. Um, and I, I thought about the story, which is based very, very distantly upon something that actually happened about an illegal immigrant in this country who has somehow survived for a long time being illegal, who is coming to enjoy life in Australia, is settling into a relationship, and one day has to make a terrible choice because he discovers that he and he alone knows the identity of a murderer. And if he goes to the police, they will ask him about his legal status in this country. But if he doesn't go to the police, he has to live with the fact that he's chosen not to reveal the identity of the murderer. And this sort of agonizing, terrible moral decision, which is something that in some form a number of people in this country have to make every day, is the core of this book. Yes. Why take the high moral ground when the country that you're in is not taking it at all? There's a great upending of the moral balance in this book. 
And one member of the Facebook group said simply, I think he has us pegged. And another Stella Glory said, I finished Amnesty by Aravinda Diga on Saturday afternoon. It's one of the best books I've read and I think my top read so far for 2021. It's stunning and frantic and funny and heartbreaking. And that's Aravind Adiga's Amnesty, which is published by Picador. Well, let's turn to the next book on our alphabetical Miles Franklin shortlist. And it's by Tasmanian writer Robbie Arnott, whose first novel was a sensation, uh, Flames, and his second is turning out to be one as well. Kate, remind us of what happens in The Rain Heron. Well, the rain heron begins with the story of a rain heron, this mythical bird which sweeps across the landscape, bringing both good fortune and vengeance in its wake. So it starts with a fable in an unknown place of farms and workers and jealousies. So when I first read this, I thought, OK, we're in for an allegorical tale. But then suddenly it shifts to the story of a woman named Wren who's living on a mountain. We're not entirely sure where she is, but there's been some sort of coup, possibly some sort of apocalyptic event, and she's hiding from soldiers. And the soldiers, it turns out, they want to find this rain heron that they've heard about. They think they can use it. So they'll do anything they can to get it. And they think that Wren, because she's a hermit who lives on the mountain, that she might be somebody who can help them find it. Now, she has no intention of revealing what she knows to these people. And the encounters that she has with them are quite brutal. So it becomes this sort of tense, almost chase story. And then... Not too far in, the story shifts and we're in this other apparently unrelated story of a girl in a coastal town and there's another almost mythical, magical creature there and this extraordinary substance is harvested from the sea. And I particularly loved this section because it was so vivid and so imaginative. But then the story comes back to this woman, Wren, and to an almost familiar landscape and a quest for this mythical figure that is perhaps um, an embodiment of some sort of ancient wisdom and natural power. And it's not necessarily a benign force either. And what did you Mm. make of this one, Nicole Abadie? Kate, it was fascinating, wasn't it? I think my favourite part was that second part where we have a character who it turns out is connected to a character in part one. I don't want to give too much away, but it it appears as if it's a deviation. It's set in this little, um, as you say, in this little south coast town, and it's all about farming squid ink. Now, if that doesn't sound like a promising subject matter for literary fiction in the hands of Robbie Arnott, it most certainly is. And I found this section absolutely captivating. The other parts of the book, it's like a quest of sorts. It's mythical. I'd written down the words fable. I'd also written down the words post-apocalyptic. We don't exactly know what the political situation is. We know there was a coup five years ago. We're not sure about this bird, whether it's a real bird, although at times we read that it dissolves into mists of spray. So that's really fascinating. There are some quite violent events that occur that are connected to this bird. Look, I found this book fascinating and again on rereading, I had read it earlier, but I read it much more closely this time and I just found it very gripping, very powerful in both its language and its subject matter. Yes, I absolutely agree with you, Nicole, and it's hard to explain why. Tom, what did you make of the structure of this? Could you define it in any way? Robbie bites off quite a bit, doesn't he? Uh, And it's a book which tries very, uh, we've used words like myth and fable, and it unselfconsciously tries to be that and and succeeds to a large extent. It isn't seeking necessarily to create a sort of a a naturalistic unpeeling of a backstory. Its structure more closely resembles the logic of myth or the logic of a cultural um, story. And so he's got big extremes. That's what I noticed about the structure is that the people are small but the themes are big and the place where they intersect is landscape and so all of these landscapes whether it's the sort of the liminal zone of the seaside town and the the squid that very are very sort of sexually milked for their ink and um, or whether it's the deep (laughs) forest of mountain it strikes me as a very Tasmanian book I know that nowhere does it sort of 
necessarily specifically place itself there, but this is Tasmania as Australia's site of mythic dreaming. But it's a, a deep, dark myth where pain and trauma and environmental destruction and destruction of community is as much part of the story as a redemptive idea or a rhapsodic idea or, a, or an idea that illuminates in some ways. Yeah. Look, it's interesting that you say you feel it's set in Tasmania because Kate and I, we, we wrestled with this, didn't we, Kate? We sure did. And interestingly, Sarah Lestrange asked Robbie Arnott, where on earth is this set when she spoke to him for the book show? And here was his response. Well, it's set in an unnamed country that I invented. I didn't specifically think of it as any place in particular. It's inspired by many other places. Um, there's lots of parts of the book that are very distinctly Tasmanian. Uh, other parts that are quite distinctly European or or even Japanese. So well, I wasn't trying to create a real place. So I was trying to invent somewhere new. Which raises the question, I guess, of, of how fiction reflects where we are. But also just thinking of the Facebook Club responses to this book, we had lots of very interesting responses. And Jennifer Reynolds said, I've read The Rain Heron twice and found it an absolute joy both times, a stirring fable filled with pain, beauty and humanity. It reads as a tale of redemption, with its main focus, the natural world and man's need to subdue its inhabitants, a hugely original story. Yes, yes. And Kelly Penfold said, The Rain Heron was startling. It's written with such a fresh voice. I was intrigued from beginning to end. Yeah, me too, Kelly. And Emma Sanford says, Is it possible to live so completely in a book that you miss it when it's over. In The Rain Heron, Robbie Arnott does an amazing job of blending, here we go, myth, fable, this is what we've all described it as, and horror in a dreamy five-part tale. Gee, this is quite an analysis. I didn't notice the five parts. That strips away the romance we tend to confer on the animal kingdom. I recommend this book at every opportunity and can't wait to reread it. And that's Robbie Arnott's The Rain Heron, which is published by text. Moving on alphabetically, author by author through the Miles Franklin shortlist, we now come to a debut novel from Sydney writer Andrew Pippos, whose Greek-Australian family ran cafes for generations in the New South Wales town of Brewarrina. Now, Tom Wright, why don't you uh, set this one up for us? Yeah, Lucky is, is the title of Andrew Pippos' novel. It's a complicated, rambling novel which takes you sometimes comically and sometimes tragically through the sort of the world of the post-war Greek diaspora in Australia, through the form of the Greek cafe as a cultural edifice. I mean, for those who can't remember, practically every town and every high street in Australia at one point had the Greek cafe, which was Greek because it was run by Greeks, but often the menu was completely Anglo. And so you had that tension between a culture that had been brought to the country and the way in which it was forced to uh, adapt to the new country. The plot here is the eponymous Lucky is an American Greek, so he's already an outsider within the Greek-Australian community who finds himself here after the war for reasons of love and through convoluted purposes finds himself actually running initially one cafe and then a string, a chain, a set of franchises, all of which are called Luckies. This intersects with another narrative where we are introduced to a British woman with an Australian mother called Emily, who, in trying to repair her career as a, a writer, finds herself pursuing this lucky, the cafe, and the ways in which it rose to become a major sort of cultural Australian icon, and then the ways in which it falls. It's an interesting very timely book in the sense that you can feel now that this is no longer a story of first generation migrants, but perhaps of second generation migrants thinking back about the grandparents' generation, not the parents' generation. It's a deeper prism. And so when you read this, on, on occasions, the whole thing feels a bit like a shaggy dog story. You almost feel like you're in Tristram Shandy, where the narrator is almost not in control of the, of the bus. And then it comes back to great heart and a great deal of feeling. One of the best things about it, I, th I think about Andrew's book, Luckies, is that he's prepared to take risks. So the big acts are big acts here. Sometimes they're cleverly done. Like there's a moment where Lucky pretends to be Benny Goodman, the jazz performer, yes. whilst the American GIs are all through Sydney in the Second World War. He, he tries to do a gig, assuming that no one in Australia knows what Benny Goodman looks like, so I might as well get away with it. And that one act of deception, that one act of trying it on, of, of chance, of fate, intersects with 
so many human beings. It leads to his marriage, it leads to his fortune, and it leads to his misfortune and his demise at the same time. And you get that sense, luck and chance, fortune and fate, these kind of very epic themes are told through a set of intersecting stories. And most of the characters are deeply, deeply connected to Australia and yet they're not from here. It's a story about a city, it's a story about the uh, migrant diaspora, and it's also a vision of Australia through unfamiliar eyes. And that's one of the more entertaining aspects as it moves towards an inevitable trajectory and the character of Eddie, the writer, uncovers the truth, both about this famous restaurant chain and her own family. Just to follow up on that idea of an epic scale, there's quite a long time frame in this book. We get backstories that go back to the 1910s and then it goes on for about 90 years. And so yeah. when Claire Nichols spoke to Andrew Pippos, she asked him about that scale. I liked the idea of a time frame that kind of matched the time frame of the Greek Australian Cafe institution. So we could see the the rise and fall of this phenomenon in, in Australian culture. There was also the possibility to show how a character could change over the course of a life. Novels with you know, that classical concentration of time and place, stories set over a day or two or a week or a month, you don't often see how the events really affect the characters' lives, how they are changed. And we are changed by the things that happen to us. We are changed and entire families are changed in this book because we also get the story of what happens to the women in these families. There are stories of working in shops, stories of secrets, stories of violence. So there's quite a lot going on in this book, isn't there, Cassie? Yeah, yeah, there is. And uh, a few Facebook people uh, made some very thoughtful comments on it, including Lloyd Swanton, who I'm assuming could only be the bass player from the band The Next, but he's obviously a member of the book club Facebook group. He says, I really enjoyed Lucky's by Andrew Pippos. He weaves a rich and many-layered tapestry across time and place. It's warm, funny, sad, absurd, bizarre, and at times horrifying. He has a great turn of phrase, and I thought the idea of making the titular character, an American Greek Australian immigrant, <laughs> was a very clever move. So we get the Greek outsider's perspective on Anglo-Australia and then we get a further outsider's perspective on the Greeks. Andrew Pippos's Luckies is published by Picador. Madeline Watts is another debut novelist, although she has published short stories as well as essays and reviews. She lives in New York, but her novel, The Inland Sea, is mostly set in Australia. Nicole Abadie, can you introduce us to this one? I love this book. It's set in the inner west of Sydney. It opens during a very long, hot summer. And the main protagonist is an unnamed female character who's living in Redfern. She's in her early 20s. The previous year, she's finished her English honours year at Sydney University, and she's taking a year off while she decides whether or not she wants to do a PhD. While she does that, she's doing a little bit of writing, but to support herself mainly, she works four days a week in an emergency call centre in a big building in Elizabeth Street in Sydney's CBD. Her job is to answer emergency calls from all over Australia and then to direct them to the right service, police, fire brigade, ambulance. Recently, she has reconnected with an ex-boyfriend who she calls Lachlan. That's not his real name, but there's a connection later on to the Lachlan River, which she makes uh, as an explanation of why she chose that name. She met him the previous year in the honours class. He was doing a PhD on Patrick White and they dated for two months before he broke it off, I might say, in quite a brutal way. After that breakup, she starts having sex with lots of different men and drinking heavily and generally, it seems, behaving in a pretty self-destructive way. And she says at one point, I wanted to be undone. Parallel to her story, there are references to a distant ancestor of hers, John Oxley, who was a real-life character, an explorer of Australia in the early 1800s who went looking for an inland sea in central Australia. The themes of the book that I perceived were the nature of unruly desire, why it is she was drawn back into this relationship with Lachlan, which seems to be a very self-destructive one, her self-destructive behaviour generally, and there's a connection there to her family history, which I won't go into. There's a theme throughout this, as there was in The Labyrinth, of violence to women. And again, as there was in the uh, Robbie Arnott book, all of this is playing out against a background of climate change. 
I thought it was a stunning debut and an excellent book on any terms. Can I also add that uh, Lachlan, the um, badly behaved ex-boyfriend, had a portrait of Patrick White in his bedroom. But let's hear Madeline Watt's description of this character that she's created. She's very lost. She's a bit adrift after finishing university and she takes a job at triple zero um, fielding emergency phone calls Um, And she is not well placed to do that. It's not a good job for her. And over the course of the book, the way that the emergencies sort of affect her makes her feel that she becomes increasingly sort of boundaryless and porous to everything that's happening to her. Well, porous is one description, I guess. It felt almost like she'd lost a layer of skin by working in this emergency context. Why did it have such an impact on her, do you think? Or perhaps it would have an impact on all of us doing that sort of job. I think she was already fragile. She was already very damaged by the way this relationship with Lachlan had ended. She says there's a lovely quote that I just had made a note of here. It sometimes felt like the emergencies of those on the phones were leaking through the borders of my own personal emergencies. So I think she takes this job at a time when she is particularly vulnerable. In terms of her her career, her work, she's deciding whether or not she wants to do a PhD. She's doing some writing on the side for literary journals and things. But she's also emotionally very vulnerable. And that's as a result of this broke up with Lachlan. And then as we learn more about her her family history, there's an explanation for deep-seated emotional difficulties, I think. And that book is called The Inland Sea and it's by Madeline Watts and published by Pushkin Press. And finally, another Australian novel written by someone no longer living in the country. Daniel Davis Wood is a writer and publisher, and he's now based in Scotland. His first novel was Blood and Bone. This is his second, and it's called At the Edge of the Solid World. Tom, maybe you could tell us about this one. A couple living in Switzerland at the top of the Alps, sort of a place where the mountain meets the sky, are having a child we get a quite graphic description of the birth of this child and its unfortunate death. It's a, a, a somewhat traumatic sort of beginning. And you think, oh, this is, might be uh, the beginnings of a story of sort of the repair, the, the damage that losing a child does to any couple. But what is interesting about it at the edge of the world is that the narrative voice is the, in the hands of the father. And this father disappears into a wormhole of almost solipsistic self-obsession. He begins to question sort of life and death and what it is to grieve. And as he's thinking about grieving, his own grief process and what it is for other people to grieve, he becomes almost hyper-obsessed by pain and trauma all around the world, particularly things such as massacres or really appalling events where human beings have been displayed at their worst and the ways in which people who are victims of these kind of events repair themselves or don't repair themselves. His marriage inevitably collapses under this kind of obsessive behaviour and yet somehow in the reading you don't feel this one lays on your shoulders like an anvil. It is a deep and dark book on occasions. It's complicated. It's perhaps the most ambitious of all of the shortlisted books, but there's a sense that someone is wrestling with something profoundly important. It's a meditation on grieving, but not necessarily excessively on grief. It's a meditation on what it is to be this sort of atomized individual at the end of the 21st century who thinks everything that happens to you is of cosmic significance and how you get that back into perspective. But its vision of what it is to be a human being isn't one of, oh, isn't life a, a, a sort of a, a tr- endless road of pain? Far from it. It actually does find its way back. And by the end of the book, we're on a cliff edge, so to speak. We're back on the edge of the solid world and something has happened. There has been some way back. It's a very interesting book. Not for everybody. can get quite claustrophobic. I'm sure a number of people will comment on this. It can be a very claustrophobic read, but it does reward the attention. After a while, you begin to think, yes, it's good to read someone with a bit of ambition, a bit of moral and writerly ambition. I'm glad you used the word claustrophobic because that's what I was thinking about, even the very opening scene, which is in a labour room. So we're inside a room and thinking about something that's happening inside a body. But then the book keeps moving inwards and then outwards to the world as he's making comparisons, I guess, between this 
intense personal life and things that are happening the other side of the seas. And so that grappling with personal and public grief is something that Daniel Davis Wood told Sarah Lestrange is one of the things that he's really obsessed with. Part of the theme of grief that I really wanted to address was the way that for those who are experiencing grief at any one time, it's something that has an overwhelming intensity while for the world at large, the public world, it is almost a trivial issue, you know, if the world at large is even aware of one's grief at all. Um, And that was the situation that the narrator gets into. But in his story, he feels that his own overwhelmingly intense grief you know, is not only paralleled by these other stories that he encounters in the news, but also maybe overshadowed by them so that they're given like a public attention and a public sympathy that his grief cannot get. Daniel Davis Wood there. And here's a comment from Kim Bal-Al on the Facebook page. The edge of the solid world blew me away. So much is included in such clever writing. I wouldn't have read it but for the Miles Franklin and I really would have missed out by not reading it. It is the best novel I've read this year. Intense, compelling and epic at times in its scope. So much to think about. Daniel Davis Wood's At the Edge of the Solid World is published by Brio. We've got through the entire shortlist, as well as discussing the winner of this year's Miles Franklin Literary Award. I wonder if very briefly, Nicole and Tom, you have anything to say about what version of Australia this shortlist gives us, given that part of the remit of the Miles Franklin Award is that these books reflect Australia in any of its forms. All of them present a vision, really, of contemporary Australia and contemporary Australian issues, don't they? I mean, just listening to us going through them, there's issues about refugees, there's issues about climate change, there's issues about violence against women, there's issues about relationships between men and women generally. They seem to cover pretty broadly the spectrum of contemporary moral and political issues, I guess, that we're living with at the moment. Yeah, it feels like uh, deep uncertainty is a co- is a core Australian quality here. Deep uncertainty about our past, and deep uncertainty about actually what we're living through, or even whether we're using the right terminology. And so, it's a fi- I feel like it was fitting that Amanda Laurie's Labyrinth won because her metaphor of the labyrinth feels like it's a, exactly where we're at in contemporary Australia. We're not quite sure where we've come from and we're not necessarily sure of the way out either. That uncertainty can be a radical uncertainty which gives us hope or joy, but it can also be quite frightening on occasions. So I, I felt like it was very much 2021 in novel form, all five of them. Yes, what a picture of the creativity as well because so many minds and so many worlds have been created just in these books and that's just the short list, not the the long list as well. Hey, thank you so much to both you, Tom, and to you, Nicole, for being great readers and taking us through this list. It's been very thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate and Cassie, for having me. And that was books writer, interviewer and podcaster Nicole Abadie and theatre writer and dramaturg Tom Wright. Stressing out on the good life and feeding without delay Making accusations but you're anxious every day Need a break from your business schedule of living five stars where you stay You're making a stand but not standing up yet You're strong and know of course you're a darling You're smart and you're well read Now, on our next book club in a month's time, we're reading books about memory. Hugh Brakey's The Beautiful Fall and an older one from Jessica Anderson, Tira Lyra by the River. And the bookshelf will be back next week with Irish writer John Boyne's latest novel, The Echo Chamber, Christine Mangan's Palace of the Drowned and Nick Earle's Empires. Oh, and before I forget, Cassie, there's one last thing we have to tell everybody. The children's mm-hmm. book writer, Andy Griffiths, he's the creator of that awesome Treehouse book series. He is going to answer kids' questions as part of Radio National's big weekend of books at the end of August. And we'd really like you listeners, parents, to make a video of your kids asking Andy a question and send it to us this week. There are details on the ABC Book Club Facebook group or online at abc.net.au/rn. <laughs>
I hope you've enjoyed our summary of the shortlist of this year's Miles Franklin Literary Award. I'm Cassie McCullough. I'm Kate Evans. See you next time. It's not magic. It's just this beautiful, perfect writing. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.